The portion of God's Word that we'll focus on this morning is taken from the Gospel of John, from chapter 1. Let's begin with prayer. O Jesus Christ, your manger is my paradise, where my soul is reclining. For there, O Lord, we find the Word made flesh for us. Your grace is brightly shining. Amen. This Christmas morning, I want you to use your imaginations. First of all, I want you to imagine that you know absolutely nothing about God. A total blank slate. Second, I want you to imagine that you're driving your car around the streets of Appleton. And as you drive, you pass a church and you notice that the sign out front invites you Meet God here today. And with your curiosity peaked, you turn your car into the parking lot and you head inside to meet God. And as an usher leads the way for you, a thousand thoughts are racing through your head. What will God look like? What will God say to me? What should I say to God? Why did I wear sweatpants? Curiously, the usher then leads you through a side door out into an alley behind the church. And outside, he points you in the direction of a a crude-looking barn filled with the, the sounds and the smells of farm animals. And your eyes settle on this young lower class couple who are who are staring down into a feeding trough with complete wonder and awe. And as you approach them, wondering where God is hiding in all of this, you finally notice that there's a newborn infant boy lying in that manger. And off to your left, a smiling man who who smells of sheep and open pasture excitedly tells you, this is the promised one. This is God. And you who know nothing about God, you, you kind of look with this puzzled look on your face and you think, this? This crying baby, this, this helpless infant who's incapable of, of speaking, let alone caring for himself, this is God? This is the one that I'm supposed to put my trust in, the one that's going to be the Savior of the world. You know, I I may not know anything about God, but this doesn't seem like it can be God. And yet this morning, we don't have to use our imaginations. Because on Christmas Day, we stand in that stable next to Mary and Joseph, our hearts pounding in rhythm, along with the shepherds, as we gaze in wonder at the baby in Bethlehem, as we meet God, as we meet God in a manger. Now that's a hard thing to comprehend. And you know that even the contemporaries of the Apostle John questioned, well, why in the world would an all-powerful God decide to become a man, let alone a helpless infant, And really, that question is still prevalent today, just with a little bit of a different flavor. The question today isn't so much, why would God become a man, but how could a man be God? People look at that baby in the manger, and they look at this beaten man dying on a cross, and they think to themselves, this can't be God. See, with both of those questions, the point of conflict is still the same. People struggle with Jesus' humanity. If Jesus is true man, then how could he also be true God? And so the Apostle John, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes his gospel account, looking to showcase the amazing grace that God shows through his son, Jesus. As John states the purpose of his gospel account, he tells us, These words are written that you may believe 
that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. John writes his gospel account so that people wouldn't scoff, this child is God? But would exclaim with faith and with joy, this child is God. So from the very beginning, from the very first words, from the very first verses of his gospel account, John seeks to highlight the unfathomable good news of Christmas. That that baby born in Bethlehem is God. Is the Savior of the world, wrapped in human flesh and blood, true God and true man. And so all of our Christmas hope and joy and certainty centers on John's one most beautiful verse. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Maybe you wonder, though, why does John refer to God the Son as the Word? What's he mean here? Well, you understand that words are used to communicate with people. And in the same way, God communicates with us through his Word. Certainly through the Word found in the Bible, but even more completely through his Son, the Word. Without the Word, the will and mind of God would remain completely hidden to us. But we're told that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And so everything that God wants to reveal about himself to us, about his nature, about his feelings towards us, he communicates those things to us through Christ. As Hebrews said, In the past God spoke through the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. And so as the Word, Jesus is both the message and the messenger. The word of promise that God spoke to Adam and Eve after the fall into sin, promising to send them a Savior, is fulfilled by the word. The word of the prophets as they looked ahead, looked forward, proclaiming that Emmanuel, God with us, would one day come, is fulfilled by the word who became flesh and blood. And so as we meet Jesus in the manger, we meet God. Because Jesus himself is God, and because God communicates with us and reveals himself to us through his Son, Christ. And so as we look at Jesus, we see things about God. God reveals things about himself to us. First of all, in Christ, God reveals his amazing love. I mean, look at the things that the Son was willing, the Word was willing to set aside so that he could become man. John tells us, in the beginning was the Word. In the beginning, at creation, when everything came to be, the Word already was. He's not created. He has no beginning or end. The Word is eternal. And John continues, and the Word was with God. Literally, he says that the Word and God had a face-to-face relationship. The triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit live in perfect unity, perfect joy. They find complete satisfaction and joy in their relationship with each other. Completely devoid of all the, the dysfunction and the jealousy that so often categorizes our own families around Christmas time. There was none of that in this perfect relationship. And it's not like the Word was just sort of hanging around with God, like a a little kid at the adult table. John tells us the Word was God. And as the all-powerful God of the universe, that means that the Word is responsible for creating everything. As John continues, Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. And so we can't fully appreciate and understand the love that God communicates to us through Christ unless we understand what the Word willingly set aside so that he could become man. The eternal Word, without beginning or end, takes on human flesh that has a beginning in the womb of the Virgin Mary and has an end 
by his death on the cross. The Word, who lives in this beautiful, perfect, unified relationship with the Father and the Holy Spirit, takes on human flesh that he bears to a cross on which he would be forsaken by his Father to pay for the sins of the whole world. The all-powerful Word, who stretched out all-powerful hands to create everything in the universe, now stretches out helpless infant hands from a manger to grasp the finger of his human mother. See, the love of God is unfathomable. And it shines forth so brightly, so beautifully from Christ, from the Word, the Son of God, who takes on human flesh and blood, who sets aside all of the power and the glory and the perfection of heaven, so that he can take on the weakness and frailty of human flesh. So that he can take on the helplessness of human infancy. So that he can take on the mortality of human nature. And why? For sinners like us. See, this isn't God just saying, I love you. This is God saying, I love you, and then backing it up with the most selfless, the most loving action possible. He takes on human flesh and blood. He becomes one of us. He becomes one with us to be our Savior. Why? Why does the Word set aside everything to become nothing? I mean, Bill Gates is not going to swap lives with a homeless man on the street. So why? Why? Because of love. Because in Christ, in the Christ child, as we meet God in a manger, we meet God's perfect love for the world. And what makes that love even more amazing is when we look at the world to which God gave that perfect love. You see, Jesus wasn't born of a virgin because he knew that he was going to come into the world and be welcomed with open arms. The creator of the world came into the world to become a fellow man with people that he himself had knit together in their mother's wombs. And what's the reaction? The world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. It would kind of be like a college student coming home on Christmas break and walking through the front doors of their house And seeing their parents and saying, who are you people? How could you not know the one who made you? How could you not know the one from whom you came? But really, isn't that our struggle too? A failure to acknowledge and to recognize who exactly Christ is. Did we see that baby in the manger and we think to ourselves, he's too helpless. He's not powerful enough to deal with my problems. We hear the word proclaimed and we think to ourselves, there's no way that he can keep all of those promises that he makes. We see him dying on the cross and we think, that can't possibly be enough for the the things that I've done, for the sins that I've committed. But really, don't all of our doubts about God stem from a failure to recognize who exactly Christ is? the all-powerful God of the universe who is far mightier than any one of our problems. The Word who is completely faithful and never fails to keep His promises. The all-powerful Word who takes on human flesh to go to a cross so that He can take away every single one of our sins. Even the sins of those who fail to recognize or believe in Him. As we meet God in a manger, we meet God's perfect mercy for an undeserving world of sinners. Jesus came into this world of darkness and sin and unbelief to shine his light, to give light and life to a world that was blind and dead. As we meet God in a manger, 
we meet God's perfect rescue plan for a world that needed to be saved. As John said, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. The word took on flesh and shone his light in the darkness and unbelief of this world so that he could win eternal life. See, light and life, they are connected to each other. If the sun stops shining, then life ceases to exist. If you take a house plant and you lock it away in a dark closet, that plant is going to die. In the same way, without the light of Christ shining in this world of darkness, then everyone is doomed to eternal damnation and death. Only through the light of Christ can we have eternal life. And so Christ had to take on mortal flesh so that he could go to a cross and die to pay the ransom price for hell-bound sinners. And Jesus had to be born as a true man so that he could live a perfect life according to God's law, as the perfect substitute for a world of imperfect sinners. See, Christ had to do all of these things. He had to become flesh and come to this world to proclaim himself as the Savior of the world so that unbelievers might be brought to faith in him. Because to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. I want you to note that verb. He gave the right to become children of God. This Christmas, whether it was yesterday or today, when you, when you gave presents to your family and friends, did you also give presents, gifts to the people in your life, to the adults and to the children who weren't always perfect? Who didn't absolutely deserve that gift that you gave them? Regardless of what the naughty list said or what the elf on the shelf saw, you still gave gifts to imperfect people. Why? Because you love those imperfect people. In the same way, God gave this gift, this right to be called children of God, not to the people who were good enough to deserve it, not to the perfect people who had earned it for themselves. Rather, he gives it to undeserving sinners who acknowledge the complete helplessness and hopelessness that they are to those who understand their complete necessity for a Savior from sin. See, Jesus gave this gift because he loves this world of undeserving sinners. And I hope you cling to those words today and every day. God gave the right to become children of God. Because of that child born in Bethlehem, you are God's child. And if today you're feeling sadness because your family here on earth is shattered or scattered by sin, then cling to the fact that you are a beloved member of God's family. If your Christmas today is, is categorized by sadness and mourning because of an empty place at your Christmas table, Cling to the fact that Jesus, your brother, is with you always. And he promises to take all those who believe in him to eternal life in heaven. If your Christmas celebration has been so distracted, so messed up by all of the stuff, all the presents, all the gifts, all the parties, the people, the decorations, then cling to the greatest gift that you're going to receive today and every day. That child born in Bethlehem our brother, who gives us the right to be called children of God. As we meet God in a manger, we meet our Savior in the flesh. And finally, as we meet God in a manger, we meet also God's task for us. John the Baptist was sent to serve as a witness to the light and God calls us to do the same in this world of darkness, to witness to the light. May our lives be, be made like the, the shepherds 
who sprinted away from their flocks and their fields to go to Bethlehem and to see this child that the angels had told them about. May we too sprint away from anything in this world so that we can bow down and worship our Savior King. May we too be moved to spread the word concerning what has been told us about this child. And so today on Christmas and every single day, may we bring ourselves and our families and our friends and anyone to the foot of the manger to stare in wonder down at the Word made flesh, our God, our Savior, Merry Christmas. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God, which goes beyond all human understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. You may be seated.